I thought Zach just hit it really well. We don't take this for granted because around the world, uh, you can't always worship freely and openly and publicly. And, uh, you know, coming back from our trip uh, over the past month, I was reminded, what's up, Jordan? How you doing? I was reminded of that, like how awesome it is to be able to worship together. And, um, and Keith, you hear it, right? Like you just don't, you don't get to do that very often. By the way, can you come up for a minute? I know, we, I want to pray for you. Um, by the way, the guy on the guitar, Sean, the good-looking bald dude, raise your hand over there. That was his first time on the guitar today. How about that? Yeah. He did great. And Keith is just an old youth guy, and I'm an old youth guy. We used to be youth pastors, you know, and, um, and it's awesome being able to serve together and serve Jesus and what you're doing. I know Amy's back in the DR, and she's kind of sick, um, but we're grateful, man, for what you're doing and, and grateful to have you with us. So... Let's just pray for Keith and for Amy together before we jump into the, the message today. Can we do that? Yeah, I love it. Yes, send your hands if you want. That's great. Lord, thank you for this man. Thanks for uh, what you're doing with him and Amy and Cole and their family. And thank you for Jim and Jean here today and uh, just uh, you know how you've worked miracles by rescuing women and saving families and how you use goofballs like us in your, in your service and ministry it just blows us away. And we are so grateful, and we love you. And I just pray your blessing on this, on this man, on his family. I pray that uh, for spiritual breakthroughs, that you would fight back at me, which wants to steal and kill and destroy, and that more and more women would be rescued. And God, give us an opportunity to be part of that as we go this fall. Uh, we just look forward to that. And I pray your blessing on Keith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh. I don't need to see the chiropractor this month. That's good. I'm just teasing. Hey, let me ask you this question. Have you ever made a crazy promise to God? Let me, let me give you an example, kind of a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Maybe you said to yourself uh, when you're in school, God, if you just help me, i got to pass this test. If you just help me pass this test, I, I promise I'll go to church for the rest of my life. I'll never miss another Sunday. Maybe you made a promise like that. Or maybe it's a little more serious. Um, you had some health issues, and so you prayed to God. You said, God, if you just give me a good diagnosis, I promise I'll never eat pizza again. <laughs> now, be careful. Like, what's your promise in there, right? Well, when, when I was younger, I made a crazy promise. Um, uh, you, some of you are going to remember this. I was watching the Cleveland Browns, all right? <laughs> See? Right there. You know. And I said to myself, we were one game away from the Super Bowl. We were playing the Denver Broncos. We had just scored. John Elway had the ball on the two-yard line. There's no way, right? So I pray. I know, it's my fault. I know. I pray. God, if you just help us win this game and go to the Super Bowl for the first time ever, I promise I'll never pick on my younger brother and sister ever again. Now you know what happened, right? John Elway, the drive, they win the game, and I'll just tell you, you'll have to ask my brother and sister how it worked out for them, right? But you make these crazy promises thinking somehow, some way that's going to influence God. Today, I've got a story for you from, uh, Tony designed this series from the book of Judges, and it's a story about a guy named Jephthah. And I've been wrestling with this all week, I'll just be really honest. I've been asking myself, how in the world did this story get in the Bible? And what am I supposed to do to make this story relevant to people? Like, it's in the Bible. It's God's written word. But, like, how can I bring it to life? And God's been working on me through his own, you know, my study time in the word. And now he gets to work on you. Because Jephthah made a crazy promise. And I think we can learn something from it, okay? So if you want, you got a Bible, open it up to Judges chapter 11 is where we're at today. And some of you I just met for the first time at the men's breakfast yesterday, and you're here today, first time in church in a long time. Welcome. Man, that was awesome yesterday, and it's great to see you today. Every week we uh, sing some songs and worship to God because we want to thank him for being the awesome God he is. Then we open up the written word of God as a way to learn more about our relationship with him. And if you want, you can pick up a Bible at any one of the doors. You can take that home with you if you don't have one. Or I'm going to put the words on the screen today. You can follow there as well. So Judges chapter 11 is where we're going to be. It's a weird and wild story from the Bible, starting in verse 1. I'll read a little bit, and then we'll work our way through it. Here's what the Bible says. 
Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Okay, so we got this guy, Jephthah. He's described right in the first verse as a what? A mighty warrior. You got it. But he's the son of a what? Prostitute. Okay, so his brothers, and I've been waiting all week to deliver this one. You ready? Who are literally brothers from another mother. <laughs> I did that first service, and there was a guy in the front row. He goes, don't quit your day job, Pastor Dave. <laughs> but they're literally brothers from another mother. They say, we don't want you here. We're not sharing our inheritance with you. Go away. That's what they tell them. All right? Everybody with me so far? Okay. So Jephthah ends up settling in the land of Tob. He's an Israelite. He's a Jew. He settles in the land of Tob. Totally different culture, inhabited by a totally different group of people, right? And verse 3 says, I love this, that Jephthah ends up hanging around with, how do you describe his friend group? A gang of scoundrels. How would you like to describe a friend group that way, right? And, and of course, you all know what happens when you hang out with certain people. In fact, the New Testament tells us in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, the Bible says, bad company corrupts good morals. Huh. So guess what happens? Jephthah ends up becoming like this gang of scoundrels, more and more like them, taking on their customs, taking on their traditions. Well, guess what happens next? Check out verse 4. We'll go on in the story here. It says, Sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Remember, he's a mighty warrior. Verse 7, Jephthah said to them, Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us, fight the Ammonites, and you will be head over all of us who live in Gilead. So the Ammonites come to fight against Israel, and God's people are desperate, and they're afraid, and they don't know what to do, so they reach out to Jephthah. The guy that they kicked out, you know, before. They said, if you come back, mighty warrior, and you fight for us, we promise we'll give you, we'll make you el jefe. We'll put you in charge. We'll make you the boss of everything. And Jephthah's like, weren't you the dude who just kicked me out of here? What do you want me to come? Oh, don't worry about that, Jephthah. Don't worry about that. That's all ancient history. You come back, and we will make you king. We will make you commander. So long story short, Jephthah agrees to go back. He goes and helps Israel defend themselves for battle. He wants to prepare for battle. And so him and his group of scoundrels prepare for the biggest battle of their lives. But just before the biggest battle, you got to see this promise he makes to God. Verse 29. Skip down to verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. (laughs) I told you it was a crazy story. Like, why would you make a promise like that? Dave, what would happen if you made a promise like that, right? Whatever comes out of the door of my house, I hope it's my pooch, you know, first, right? (laughs) He's probably thinking, I don't know what he was thinking, but he makes this crazy promise. What is this about? Whenever you read something like this in Scripture, you got to ask yourself, there's something more going on here. Like, what's, what's behind this? Jephthah was raised as an Israelite. He knew the God of Israel, the God that we serve. He knew that that God, according to the law, you can see the verse behind me, does not require human sacrifice. Now, what's ironic is, even though he knew his God didn't demand human sacrifice, the Ammonites, who he was going to go into battle against, they absolutely believed in human sacrifice. 
They felt if we sacrifice our, our children, those most precious to us, then the gods will give us victory. So you can see what happened to Jephthah. Was, it, was his faith weak? Was he trying to manipulate God into somehow winning this battle? Or had Jephthah spent so much time in the land of Tob with this gang of scoundrels that he had become so much like them that he had forgotten what his God was really like? He had forgotten what his God really wanted from him, the one true God of the universe. And that got me thinking. got me thinking about my own life. <laughs> I told you, God works on me with these messages. Like, what informs my picture of God? What I think of who God is and what God wants from me. And what about you? What informs your picture of who God is and what God wants from you? So it got me thinking about our culture here in Medina. Medina County. And I, I love it here. It's a beautiful place, great place to live. But let's think about what our culture does to us, like what messages our culture sends to us. Think about the people that we surround ourselves with. Jephthah's gang of scoundrels had a huge influence, huge impact on his life. How do your friends impact you? Or... Like, what impact are you having on your friend group, right? So, so people have an impact on us. They start to form our beliefs about certain things. Secondly, our culture here in Medina County places a high value on, on several things, two of which, I think, are education and sports. Everybody I talk to, educate my kids playing this sport. He's going to the best school. He's going to be in the best college, right? So how does this view of culture affect our faith? Have you ever thought about that? Like, what messages do we send to our kids when we make education and sports the most important priorities in the world rather than their faith? Hmm. Think, about, think about social media and how that affects our view of who God is and what he wants from us. This endless scrolling on social media. How does that impact our understanding of God? What messages do we allow into our life based on that? So I got to thinking about all this, and then I, I thought about, like, okay, our, our greater culture, and I've, I've been, had the privilege of pastoring here for 10 years, been pastoring for, like, 30 years, and there's some common messages that I hear from people about what they think God is like, their view, their understanding of God. So I want to list a couple of these, uh, ones that are more common. First one goes like this. I believe that God exists and that he or she created some things, but they really don't, this God doesn't really want anything to do with me or my life. Like this God is more like the, the force from Star Wars. Just kind of exists out there. And when I pray, I pray to the universe. Because this God certainly isn't personal or relational at all. That's, that's one view I hear quite a bit of. The next view I hear about God is people who say, I think God is mad at me. He's like that angry old man across the street. I grew up on North Avenue in Parma. There was a dude who lived right across the street from us. Every time our ball went on his grass, he was yelling. So what did we do? We kicked the ball on purpose onto his grass, right? <laughs> but some people think this is, this is who God is like. He's never satisfied. He's never happy. He's always angry. He's looking to zap you in one way or another. This is a view that people have of God. They're afraid of him. Third thing that I hear a lot of is these people who think that God is just a God of love and harmony and rainbows and unicorns. He's just such a, a kind, always, and, and just always over-the-top kind of God. And as long as I keep going to church and making him happy, then he'll give me happy things. It's like if I just rub the genie's bottle, God will just keep doing good things. And these are three views, at least, that rise to the top of what people think God is like. Okay, now, keep all that in mind, because Jephthah went to Tob, and he had this culture influencing him. And he thought he had to do certain things to make this God happy. I want you to see the rest of the story. This is where it gets wild. Look at verse 32. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites. And the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Error to the vicinity of Mineth, as far as Abel, Kerimim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. Then Jephthah, when Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried. Oh, no, my daughter, 
You've brought me down and I'm devastated. I've made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you've given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites, but grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. Verse 38, you may go, he said. And he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. <laughs> I told you this was wild. That story is in the Bible. What do you do with that? Better yet, like if you're Jephthah, what do you do with that? Why do you make these crazy promises? He was so influenced by where he was living in the land of Tob. He thought this was the right thing to do. So let me ask you the million dollar question. What's informing your view of God? What do you think God is like? Remember what I told you? The answer here at Heartland is always... Jesus! Woohoo! You guys are right. That's exactly right. So here's our big idea for today. Jesus shows us who God is and what he wants for us. Jesus shows us who God is and what he wants for us. You guys, Jesus is God in human flesh. Study his life and his teachings in the scripture. You'll discover who he is. You'll discover what he's like. And I'm here to tell you today that he is God, and he's the God who created you. He created you in his image. The Bible says, you can see it behind me, he has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. This God is personal and relational. He's not some cosmic force out there. We don't pray to the universe as Christians. We pray to the God who created the universe. That's who we pray to. And this God, big and strong and transcendent and powerful, he knows every hair on your head. For some of you, that's easier than others, right? <laughs> Sean, he loves you. I'm sorry, dude. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. That was too easy. He loves you. He wants to be involved in every detail of your life. And that's my next point. The God of the universe loves you personally. Like he knows you. You don't, have to, you don't have to make crazy promises to get this God to love you or to do things for you. In fact, follow me on this if you're taking notes. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. Why? Because you are his child. He created you in his image. He loves you. Why? Because you're his. He's not angry with you. He's not trying to figure out how he can zap you and send you to hell. He's trying to figure out how he can get you to be with him in relationship forever, starting today and lasting for eternity. This God is the God who's pursuing you. He created you in his image. He loves you. And, you ready for this? Here we go. Although he loves you more than you'll ever know, maybe more than you'll ever be able to experience, He's more concerned about your holiness than he is about your happiness. Okay, Pastor Dave, what do you mean by that? Does God not want me to be happy? Yeah, he wants you to be happy, but he's more concerned about your holiness. What do I mean? As we give our life to Christ, as we commit our life to him, as we turn from our own way of doing things and turn to him, that's called repentance. As we do that, we follow Jesus, and guess what happens? We become more like him. We become holy. We become like the person that God created us to be. So in every situation, when we're being a mom or a dad at home, we ask ourselves, next decision, what would Jesus do here? How would he handle this situation? When we're at work and we own our business or we're working for the man, right? We ask ourselves, how would Jesus respond here? What would he say? What would he do? And we, in this process of following after Jesus, we become like him, like he designed us to be. From the very beginning, we become holy. We learn to trust him, and he opens up the path. And, and let me tell you, like, it's an awesome way to live your life. Like, it's scary and wild and exciting and fun. If 
following Jesus by faith is how we were designed to live. It brings life into your bones. And I want to invite you to that today. As I was uh, studying and preparing this message and as we wrap up, I had God, I think it was God, put, put this uh, invitation on my heart that I want to extend to you today. And, you know, we don't, we don't do an invitation every week, but I want you to know, um, if you want to know more about Jesus and a relationship with God and what that looks like, please come talk to us. We would, that's why we're here. We would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus. But this invitation today is a little different. And I think it's for somebody here, okay? So I'm just going to ask uh, if we kind of create a a private moment. Can you just close your eyes and bow your heads for just a second? Ooh, the lights came down. That was cool. Just between you and God, okay? And and I'm going to look, but I want to look because I want to pray. I'm going to keep it confidential. I don't want anybody looking around. Here's what I think God's put on my heart. I think there's some people here today who have spent too much time in the land of Tob. Here's what I mean by that. I feel like you've allowed the culture to influence you and to change you and give you a a misunderstanding of who God is and what he's like and what he wants for you. And I want to invite you to repent today, to turn away from that. Maybe, Maybe you've been hanging out with the wrong people and you know that they're influencing you and it's not been positive. Maybe you live in a neighborhood where every night they're drinking and it's leading to other things and it's not good. Maybe you, you, you just been, you know, the social media thing has been influencing you and you're, you're on it too much and it's making you angry and bitter and you know it's not good. I want to invite you to repent, to turn away from that today and to turn to Jesus. He loves you. He's got a plan for your life. He wants to live in relationship with you today. He's not angry with you. If that's you today, and you just you want to take that first step of repentance, I would like to pray for you like so many that I prayed for first service. Could you just, just between me and you, nobody's looking around, could you just raise your hand until I see it? Thank you, man, and put it back down. Thank you, thank you, amen, thank you. Wow, praise God, thank you, I see it. Thank you, thank you, yes, amen, I got it. Got it over here. Thank you. Up top. Got it. Thank you. Yep. I see it. Thanks, brother. I've lived in the land of Tob. (laughs) Parts of my life. It's no fun. In the end, it will destroy you. I I just don't want to live there anymore. Is there anybody else? I I just want to pray for you. Lift you up today. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Got it. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Got it. I see it. Yeah, thanks, man. Between you, me, and God, and I'm not talking. I'm a pastor. It's confidential. (laughs) Heavenly Father, uh, yeah, thanks. Heavenly Father, I just... um, (sighs) Thank you for this crazy story that I've been wrestling with all week, and I, I had no idea if it would apply or not apply, but you've applied it to my life. And I pray for those today. You know them personally, those who've raised their hands and said, I've, I've lived there too long. I might be there right now. And God, I, I, don't, I don't want this culture to drag me down and destroy me. I, I know there's an enemy who wants to steal from me, kill me, and destroy me. And, and he's the devil, and I don't want anything to do with him. So God, I pray for these people right now. God, I pray that you with your love and in your mighty strength, you would win them back. Just like that, that woman that Keith shared about earlier that they rescued and is in church and worshiping you. God, you want us to, to be rescued from the claws of, of darkness and sin. And you want to draw us back into your loving arms. God, I pray for those folks right now. I pray for myself. I pray for those who are blinded by sin and don't even know it. God, in your mighty power, speak to them through the power of our resurrected King. We pray that uh, revival would start in our hearts as we turn back to you. Thank you for this example from Scripture. Thanks for the opportunity to worship you today. You are our King, and we love you. And we pray this in the beautiful and powerful name of Jesus. And everyone together said, Amen. Amen.